Cool. OK. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Thanks, everybody, for sticking with us after delay. There was a meeting in here right before, ended right before 9 o'clock. So we've been scrambling to get all the gear set up. This is the most gear-heavy uh, workshop so far. Um, so perfect day for that to happen. Um, it's Halloween, yes. Um, and my context has just arrived. I'm Wayne, she's Garth. Um, so party on. Um, this is the last of the Dash workshop series. And it's going to focus on media production. Um, I want to thank all the people who have attended over the past six weeks. Um, all the people who have helped out. Uh, especially uh, lots of people in the university libraries and CLA OIT, OIT. Um, all the different presenters and things like that, and everybody who attended. So um, this is going to be, um, it'll be kind of what I think I have five parts to this workshop, five or six parts to this workshop. Um, be an introduction to kind of the philosophy and practice of media production from a, a documentary production angle, which is what I have the most experience in, and what I think people who are here to help out from CLA OIT as well. So we'll talk about, um, you know different types of production gear that you have. So cameras, uh, audio, and lighting. Uh, then we'll have some hands-on time. I know the people in Duluth, you've got Adam to facilitate your hands-on time, which is awesome. Thank you, Adam. Um, people in the room here will we'll go around and, and try out some different scenarios and things like that uh, with different microphones and different cameras. And we'll talk about some of the differences between them. Um, then we're going to go over to post-production, give you an overview of the process of editing. Uh, different platforms that are available to you, um, different questions you need to consider uh, with those platforms. Um, you know, iMovie versus iMovie on the iPad versus Final Cut X versus um, Premiere versus Avid versus Windows Movie Maker. Actually, we won't talk about Windows Movie Maker. Um, then we'll have a little group exercise of editing uh, with some footage that I brought in uh, that we shot. Uh, this is Sarah, Robinson, <laughs> Sarah Robinson's footage that I keep using. Uh, that we shot a couple years ago in CLA OIT. And then finally, we'll, we'll end with some resources on campus and off for you to keep going and keep learning with this stuff, um, both in terms of you know, training, you know, specific lynda.com courses, or places like IFP, uh, which is an independent uh, community media center, um, but also the places on campus where you can check out gear. So you can check out the cameras. Everything, I believe everything that you will see here, with the exception of this stuff, is check outable. Um, and so you can use this for your own your own videos. Um, you can ask me to borrow my stuff if you really need to. Um, I'm, I'm usually will let it go. So um, anytime if you have questions, uh, let me know. Um, also on the chat if you have questions, Garth is monitoring the chat um, and he will uh, forward them to me. Um, I do reserve the right to say it's coming next because Usually that happens in these workshops. I'm like, yep, I'm getting there. Don't worry. So I, I will do that. Um, OK, so, so when you're thinking about video, when I first started getting involved with video, it was, I don't know, six years ago. I got a camera in my hand and uh, said, oh, I just need something shot. OK, this place has cameras. Let's check it out and let's try it out. Um, I had no idea how involved it is to get started in, in filmmaking and even just really basic video production. There are so many things to think about. Um, I dove in with my project, which, was, which eventually has taken me to four different continents and spanned five different languages. That's not a good thing to start off with your very first documentary or kind of like large project. Um, it's, you know, you have to be really intentional in how you're thinking about a, a video project when you're incorporating video or audio or things like that. Um, there are so many different things to think about, as you will learn today. Um, but I don't want to lose that uh, that spirit of like, go get a camera and start shooting, because that's a really important aspect of this kind of work. Um, or just get a microphone and start recording people with their permission, of course. Um, you know, it's you. I've learned 95% of what I know from doing it. Um, as long with, along with a lot of lynda.com courses, a lot of workshops, and a lot of making mistakes. Um, so trying to find that balance between you know, just getting something and going to start doing it and figuring it out on your own, and then you know, feeling like you need to storyboard everything, or you need to have all the right gear, you need to get all this money if you're coming from the documentary, you need to get all this money to do it first. 
um, and feeling that you can't get started because you don't have the right tools, you don't have the right training. Um, so, so trying to find that balance, and that, that is a kind of individual discovery in a lot of ways. Um, how do you, you know, position yourself and what you want to do and think through, you know, this whole process of where this might go to. So if you're recording this interview with someone, you know, where will that live afterwards? Um, where, you know, is that going to be publicly available or not? Is it going to be edited? Will you give a copy of it to them? Are you going to let them show it? You know, just starting to think through some of these scenarios with the video project. Um, I realize it might be hard to take me serious in, in this getup, but um, I do know what I'm talking about. So, and as I said, um, this is from a documentary filmmaking perspective, which I think is the majority of what people here um, taking this workshop or watching this workshop uh, will be doing. Um, if you want to go to, you know, narrative filmmaking or feature filmmaking or, you know, things like that, that's a different set of skills, but a lot of the stuff will transfer over uh, to that as well. Any questions so far? Are you good on the... Okay. Okay, cool. So, um, do we have cameras set up back there? Awesome. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna mosey over over here, and hopefully Gary can follow me, and I will close this. Actually, can you grab that, Rebecca? Grab yeah, I have your open coffee. So there's. When I started teaching this workshop three years ago, um, there were about two different kinds of cameras that we were working with. Um, now there's three because these things have gotten a lot better and a lot more people are using these and the iPhone to shoot video. Um, there was a story a few years ago, there was a Korean director who shot an entire feature film on his iPhone. Now he had $5,000 of equipment around it to light it and do all the sound and everything like that. Um, but he still, he shot it on the phone. Um, so, but there are some key differences between uh, the three types of cameras I'll talk about and we'll go through each one of them. Um, the first one is what I'm holding now. We have another one you can pass it around, DSLR. Um, they are, oops, I'm gonna stay over here so the camera can see me. I'm not making Gary upset. Um, the thing about the DSLR is that they are photo cameras. Um, they're designed for photos, uh, for still photos, and um, yeah, the, that's cap. There you go. Um, they are designed for still photos, but their larger sensor size uh, makes them ideal for shooting video. Um, they give a much greater depth of field which is when you see, when you look at your, your finger closely up to your face, everything out is blur, everything is blurred out in the background. That is a conventional film look that a lot of filmmakers love to achieve. And this, you know, this allows them to do that. Um, they have, if you can see, their lenses will come off with these. So don't worry, don't, I'll come back over there. So you have a lot more flexibility in terms of lenses. And so this pops off. I can put that lens on here. I can put other lenses on here. You know, we can get adapters and, you know, put old lenses that we find that are really, really good or really expensive lenses on here with special adapters and things like that. So you have a lot more control over what type, what type of lens you use. Um, they are, well, we'll talk a little bit more uh, features about when we get into the specifics of white balance and aperture and focus and things like that. Uh, some of the drawbacks of this are that there are conflicting reports on the reason for this, but um, usually there is a set limit to how much you can record on these. Um, it's either 12 minutes or 24 minutes, maybe, maybe more at a time. You can you can use you know if you have a card big enough, you can record for you know two hours or whatever it is, but at one time, it'll, it'll automatically stop recording after 12 minutes or 24 minutes. And so if you are doing an interview with someone or an oral history, you have to be aware of that uh, because it'll make a break in your footage and you can't recover that. Um, so, so that 
that's the DSLR very quickly. If we go into the JVC, thank you, Laura. Uh, this is standing in for a conventional chip video camera, a sensor video camera. Um, these have a set lens. You usually can get zoom in a lot more on this lens, but you suffer in um, image brightness um, because it will go down um, a few different stops. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but you can record for a lot longer for this. One of the reasons I've heard for the DSLR's limit is that they couldn't sell it as a photo camera if there was the ability to record for much longer amounts of time. Yeah? Does the DSL, does that have audio recording? We'll get to that. That's one of the drawbacks of that camera, um, which is why I'm always running a separate audio system, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, you have better audio on these. You see XLR inputs. Um, these are special cores that are used for microphones um, for these types of cameras. Usually, you have a lot more, um, no, not necessarily more control, but um, these are more user friendly because you have, you know, we call it the servo zoom. You don't, you know, the you just move back and forth, and that zooms in and out. Where you have to zoom with these, you have to zoom, you know, with the lens itself, and it's not as natural if you've only used those types of cameras. Um, and then finally, the iPad. You've been using more and more people have been using these. Um, one of the things that needs to be this is getting annoying. Um, I don't really wear hats, so one of the things that we've had to contend with in shooting with these types of videos is that they will automatically adjust for different types of light um, over the course of a scene. So if I'm pointing it this way, it's going to look one way. It's going to you know, adjust to that light coming from outside. And if I pull it this way, it's going to adjust to that light. And so we don't have a lot of control unless you put some specialized apps on here um, to, to lock it on some kind of setting. So that's really good for um, if you're doing the interviews. So let's talk about a few concepts um, with these. And actually, I'm going to grab the whiteboard and bring it back over here. Don't need that. Rawr. And these, these concepts will pervade any camera that you use. <laughs> okay. What? I know. So the first one we'll talk about is you know here's a lot about frame rate and resolution. And so you'll see things like 720p or 1080p or 480i, things like that. We'll break each one of these down. So the 720, sometimes you see one more, 24 or 720p, 30. So when you see these, the 720 is the horizontal, no, the, the vertical, right? 1920 by 10, it's the vertical. It's the, vertical the vertical side of, of your screen resolution. So for instance, this is 1920 by 1080. Now, when you see this first number, we know that's the, the horizontal or the, the vertical side of your image, how big it is. Generally, HD is considered 1920 by 1080. Now we're getting more and more into 4K resolutions, where there is more than 4,000 pixels on that dimension. Really big, really big files, really hard to, to manipulate um, in a lot of conventional editing programs. But it's getting more and more getting there. Yeah? So we're talking about density, not distance. Density, yes. Well, it's pixels. And so there are 4,000 pixels across, 1080 pixels down. So, so it. Oh, yeah. That's that's the space you have to work with, in there. 
Is that? I, there, it's kind of both because you have, you ha I think of distance as, you know, one pixel, you know, here and then, so it's it's distance across, but it's not distance between. Does the number of pixels vary. The number of pixels varies depending on your resolution on your camera and the settings okay. that you you choose. Um, so. It, is it, is it, it can, it can, there were, there are ways where, so if you upgrade, if you upload a video to YouTube that is uh, 1080, 1020 by 1080, it's going to, it's going to down res it to 720 most of the time. So you can, you can go down a lot, but you usually can't go up uh, because you're trying to recreate pixels or you're zooming in or things like that. So there's flexibility in terms of, but even with the, the, the screens, this is why we have all these issues with resolution when we're, when we're on projectors, because the projection resolution might be different. And we have to adjust things here so, and there. So should I be thinking of it as pixels having variable size? Mm -mm. Nope. It's what the image, working within that frame, what other devices might do with that, with that size image. So there's, this gets into some of the, what I think of as the black magic domain of where you know we're trying to have print have projectors and then we get into print and then we're not even talking about printing then we get into DVDs and that's that's a whole other workshop of figuring out so you know basically what I what I will do is it'll either be 1920 by 1080 or if it's a lecture or something that is not very cinematic and we don't really care about having it be the full resolution I'll put it at 720 um, and have that be archival copy rather than spending you know a couple more gigabytes to make it a you know a, a 10, 10, 1080 by or 1920 by 1080 file so now going to P so P stands for progressive and when you see I sometimes you see 1080 I that goes stands for interlaced um, older TVs they worked by interlacing two halves of the image together. Um, more contemporary uh, monitors and basically every computer um, now does progressive, where it shows the whole image at the same time. So like a complete you know, uh, film frame, complete image each time. So you generally want to uh, export your footage and shoot your footage unless given specific guidelines by someone who is broadcasting it. Um, but I don't know anybody who would want stuff in interlaced anymore. Um, so if you're working with older cameras, there still will be options to have interlaced. Um, but you basically just want to shoot everything in progressive now. Um, you can de-interlace footage afterwards. You might see some artifacting, depending on the quality of the algorithms doing the de-interlacing. Um, but, you know. And if you don't de-interlace, your image will get um, they call tearing, it'll have jagged edges because it's those two different fields not quite connecting. But they did interlacing in the beginning to make it smoother. You know, your eye would accept one image coming in as the other image was going out, but they didn't have the ability to show things at a very fast rate or, you know, so they interlaced to make up for it. But now our equipment's a lot better and you can show the full frame. It was the same bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah. It was mostly the same bandwidth. I don't think they cared about the humans watching it. <laughs> um, so, so we've got progressive interlace. Now the last number, 30 or 24, or 60, you'll see sometimes. This is frames per second. Film cameras run at 24 frames per second. Unless you want to US. shoot, hot, what, in the US. US. You're in the UK or other places, that's 25. I think that has something to do with the voltage, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that, that gets fun when you're shooting in some place and want to use that footage someplace else, um, which has different standards. A, a, a general rule of thumb at there is that there are very few standards when it comes to video. And they change wherever you go in the world. Um, unlike images, I think there is a much more set uh, standards of images. So. Most times in the United States, you'll see 30, 24, and 60. And sometimes you'll see 29, 9, 7. Because with video, 
video started out just in, similar to interlacing that there was not they didn't shoot at 24 frames per second um, so they had these these really approximate calculations so there'd be 23 you know 97 or 29 97 so close to 24 close to 30 but not quite um, contemporary cameras uh, will shoot full frame 24 uh, uh, frame rates like that um, General rule of thumb, 24 looks more like film, 30 looks more like television. The higher frame rate you go, the more motion you will see. Um, this is also related to a few other concepts we'll talk about. Um, but there's a little bit more, some people say they can't see it, I can totally see it between 24 and 30. Um, there's just a little bit more, what's the word, it's not, it's, Blurring, yeah. I, I was trying to describe the motion, the motion of 30 frames a second. Uh, but yeah, there's a little bit more kind of filmic blur in the footage when he shoots it at 24. Um, I don't think I've ever shot anything at 30. I just learned very early on to shoot 24. Um, for television, there will be uh, things that need to be shot at 30 uh, frames a second. Sports or something with fast action, then you generally want a higher mm -hmm. frame rate, 30 yeah. or 60. And you know, then you're getting to 60 frames a second, and then you're getting up to 120, 240. Then you get into MythBusters, Phantom Camera mm -hmm. kind of stuff, where you're shooting at 10,000 frames a second for super super slow motion. Uh, or you know, if you shoot less, then you're getting fast motion because it's only getting, you know, it's getting fewer images, so it looks faster. Um, one of the interesting things about frame rates in film history is that they were not standardized until the 20s or 30s, which is why you see a lot of uh, old film looks sped up is because they were shooting, some were shooting at 12, some were shooting at 15, some were shooting at 10, some were shooting at 20. And so they've had to conform these to modern standards. So that's why you know, people are like jumping around kind of weirdly because they're trying to recreate, not recreate, but compensate for um, where they were shot at um, in the early days. You look to the projector to yep. crank it at the right speed. Yep. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about that anymore unless you want to, and I don't know why you would. Um, we have it, s in so many ways, we have it so much easier now than people even 20 years ago did in terms of video production, um, which is why we can do these kinds of workshops. Because there are things available to you um, that you can start working on very quickly with without a, a, a super steep learning curve. Um, any questions so far? Online. Yeah. Fine. Okay. So we've talked about frame rate resolution. Now. Right, yeah. What's up? Does this affect how long you can film? Like the yes. Um, so you asked if this determines how long you can shoot. What will determine how long you can shoot is mostly this. So I can get, you know, two hours shooting at 720. I can get maybe an hour or 45 minutes shooting HD, full, full HD, 1920 by 1080. And I could probably get like 10 minutes on 4K. You know, they're, they're bringing out 500, mega, 500 gigabyte SD cards now to use in a camera for so some of these. Is the size of yeah. It's not that the camera can't do it. Yeah. Unless you're shooting on a DSLR. Yeah. At one time. Right. Yeah. You have to st restart each clip. Oh. Yeah. So there's a few things you've probably heard about as if you've been playing around with different cameras um, that have a big impact on your your work or what your image will look like. Um, the first one is white balance. This is one of those things that I like to teach people about because they don't think about light. It's just light's light. But if you look at these lights here and you look at the lights outside in the hallway, they have a very different color to them. Or you look at the light outside. Um, I think it's in the basement of Wilson, or it's in the, the lobby of Wilson, there are two very, very different casts of light in the, the hanging fixtures like this. It bugs me. 
because we don't like to mix light. So white balance, these are measured in kelvins. And it's, it ranges from lower kelvins, which will have more of a reddish hue, up to higher kelvins, which have a bluish hue. Now, you have to adjust your camera for the type of light you are using. Um, we've seen a couple lights. We see one light up here. This is an LED light. That's a very blue light. Is a, that's LED, right? Not flare. Or is it, it fluorescent? Is LED. Okay. It's a very blue light. So look at the difference between these lights here and that light there. You can see the color cast. Um, and so you're, you will need to adjust your camera and have your camera match that because cameras are not as good at um, adjusting to changes in light and these kinds of light as our eyes are. Um, so you, you, you have different ways of setting on a camera. You know, this, it's, it's daylight, it's cloudy. You sometimes will see in the winter when, it's, when there's snow on the ground and it's kind of dusk, you walk under a shadowed tree and it's very blue and that's, that's why. So you have to adjust for those, and you can see when Laura flips on that, this is a much warmer light. And that's a, this is a tungsten light, mm -hmm. so much, a much more conventional uh, kind of film set light. Can you get it? Or should I <laughs> can you get the, uh, <laughs> look at the light. Uh, let's see how that, how that camera is in, in detecting. Um, and doesn't the, that LED have a range of colors? This one does not. This one is only 56 Kelvin. Range of brightness. And so and that one is... a range of brightness, yes. Yeah. So sometimes you will have specific, as I said, you have specific things you can, you can set it to. So you'll have you know, cloudy, bright, um, LED, or you know, like fluorescent, um, tungsten, things like that. Um, some other cameras will let you just set a Kelvin range. And so I can, it goes from, it goes from zero to 1100, 1200? For? Top end of the Kelvin, or 11,000? 11, yeah, 11,000, I would say. Something like that. 5,000 is daylight. 50, 55, like 5,000, 5,500 is like bright sun at noon. But when you get up to the higher end, you're going to like 11,000, 12,000. So you can set on some cameras, like the DSLRs, you can just set a specific Kelvin uh, scale. Say, I want this at 5600. And it allows you for some finer grain control. Like, I like this a little warmer, or I like this a little cooler, things like that. Um, you can also set um, with, I haven't had as much success with the DSLRs, but in a lot of video cameras, um, what you will do is hold up a white piece of paper or a different uh, color piece of paper if you're going to do a more advanced white balance and focus on the white piece of paper and then press the white balance button and it balances to that, that white that it sees and then you're theoretically it is co color balanced for um, your shoot. Something to keep in mind why it bugs me about mixing light it's not just because of some OCD tendencies I have. It is because they are really hard to, to um, navigate and manipulate afterwards. So if you need to change something in the color afterwards, it's really tricky to try and do that. So as much as possible, do not mix light unless you are a really, really good professional lighting person um, or have lots and lots of experience doing that. The other reason too is if you if you have mixed light and then you do a white balance, it can skew the other colors because mm -hmm. you're telling your camera this is what white looks like and it will reference all other cameras based on or uh, other colors based on that white. So if you're mixing two different colors of light, it can screw up your other colors. Yep. So. Yep. So just keep that in mind as you're working on this. It's something that you will need to do every time. And you'll, you'll look through the lens and say, hey, that looks really weird. And so, okay, try to white balance it first is the way to get, get there first of all. And that's kind of the global things you can do to start with. Then we're getting into these other settings. Shutter, aperture, focus, and zoom. Um, ISO slash gain. 
So shutter is one setting of, of how much light is getting. If you think of a shutter on a film on a on a you know still camera, um, that's the amount of time it's open. So one fortieth of a second, one five thousandth of a second, things like that. It's a little different when you're shooting video. Um, generally, you want the shutter to be um, twice as much as your frame rate. So if you're shooting at you know close to 24 frames a second, you want your shutter to be 48. If you're shooting at 30, you want it to be 60. And generally, I have never had to mess with the shutter for any other reason. Sometimes you will for a certain effect. Um, my favorite is in the wire. They use high shutter. Um, and you see a lot more motion, kind of we were talking about with the frame rate. You see a lot more motion um, between just when someone's moving their hands. And it gives a, I don't even know how to describe it, like a, it's like clipped or it's, it's a way of, of giving a different, a really different subtle feel to the movement of a scene. So they use it a lot in scenes of high drama or chase scenes or things like that. Um, but unless you're looking for a specific effect, I've never messed with the shutter beyond setting it to 48 or 60. Um, sometimes you might have to if, to get a little more light in the scene, but I think there are other ways of, of achieving that as well. Um, aperture. Aperture is measured in f-stops. So if you, you know, if you hear someone say stop down to x, y, or z, or this is five stops, you know, further or things like that. This is another version of how much light the is letting, getting let into the camera. Um, you can go down pretty low, but going from zero to uh, roughly 25 is a general scale for aperture. Um, zero means it is completely open, all the lights getting let in, and you know, closer to 25 is completely locked down. Very little lights getting into it. So I've had to go, I've had to shoot inside and outside in the same day and I'm moving back and forth between these. Um, so I've had to go, you know, I'm inside, I'm at f2.8 and then I go outside and I'm at f20. Um, so you just have to keep in mind those things as you are, you know, shooting, these, uh, shooting in different places. Um, another thing about aperture is that it's going to, um, have an effect on how much depth of field you have. So a higher aperture is going to have less depth of field. And so you need, if you want to get that um, higher, um, let's see, if you want to get a more shallower depth of field, you have to allow more light in, but you have to be, you have to be careful that you're not um, overpowering the subject in terms of light. And so there's it's always this kind of balance between these different factors. Um, because what people used to do to get that was to put the camera a lot further back and then zoom in on the person. So they get that um, shallow depth of field. But now with these DSLRs and so much more light being able to get into the camera, um, they can achieve that. So. Um, I mentioned zoom earlier. Is there anything you want to add on aperture? I mean, is it not really? Okay. Just uh, just regarding depth of field, the the things that influence depth of field are your aperture. Mm -hmm. So a bigger aperture gives you softer depth of field. If you need things to be more sharply in focus in the whole frame, then you want a smaller aperture. But also distance from subject to camera mm -hmm. that also affects your depth of field. So if you want more sharpness, you want to be farther, well, yeah. It gets, it gets really it gets, squishy right. because you, you, you're, Focus, you're talking about multiple scales. Distance and zoom and, yeah. and, right, so. Yeah. Um, so we talked about zoom as, you know, with these different cameras. Generally, um, unless you are using a really, really nice lens with a DSLR on the order of $2,000, $3,000, you're going to lose three to four, sometimes more stops as you zoom in on a camera. And as, and as a, a video camera, a conventional video camera as well. Um, just because they are, they are built with that flexibility of zooming in to see something here, to see something outside on the mall. Right. Um, and then keeping in mind too that the, the, other, the third thing that affects your depth of field is the, the, um, uh, the focal length. Mm -hmm. So as you zoom in, 
you're increasing the focal length, which means that you're making your depth of field more shallow. Mm -hmm. And a wider lens, which would be zooming out, gives you a sharper depth of field. Yep. So. so when you talk about focal length, we're talking about these in millimeters. So the lens that we have on this one here is 18 to 200. Let me pass that down. And you can zoom in by pulling on that ring. And it has a lens cap on. And it has a lens cap on too. Um, whereas the one that, um, that I passed around, um, you know, as a prime lens, it means it does not zoom at all. It just stays fixed at 28 millimeters. These aren't questions you have to worry about. <laughs> Kate is double fisting uh, <laughs> DSLRs. Um, the, uh, you don't have to worry about these as much with a conventional video camera um, because they have one, one set lens. Um, this one goes from 3.7 millimeters to 37, oh, F, that's interesting. This goes much more than 37 millimeters. I don't, I don't see what it is, but generally it's, you know, like a 50, 50 times zoom lens on these cameras. Um, and there's, there's something called, uh, there's optical zoom and then there's um, digital, zoom. digital zoom. And so optical zoom is actually using the, the optics of the lens and changing and bending the light to, to zoom your image. Whereas digital zoom is just taking your image and blowing it up digitally. Mm -hmm. Which you need to be really careful with because you start getting blocky images and pixelation and things like that because, um, yeah, I almost never use digital zoom. I will, the sensors are big enough even, even when, um, even with uh, smaller uh, cameras like phones and iPads and things like that, that I'll take a big picture and then crop it out later. I'll go in and zoom it in that way rather than, you know, uh, you know, swiping in to zoom when you're taking an image on your phone. Um, because I, you know, I think there's more than 3,000 pixels in, uh, on one side of an, an iPhone image. And so it, it's a good enough resolution where I, I know that I can zoom in later um, just by cropping. Um, last one, you'll see these terms ISO and gain. So these are ways of digitally brightening an image. ISO is comparable to ASA in the film world. It's the amount of, of light that this film you know, lets in or if it's, it's specific for that, that to those types of conditions. So ISO is, usually it goes 100, 200, 400, 800, 600 or 1600, 32, 64, but some other cameras, I think the 60D is included in this, they'll have much finer uh, possibilities. So they'll have you know, 1250 and 1500 and things like that. Um, gain, you usually see video cameras have them as low, medium, and high. Um, they increase noise in your image. Um, one of the things that has gotten better over the years with different camera manufacturers is how they handle that noise when you're trying to digitally brighten an image. Um, generally, my experience, unless you're going with a really high-end you know, kind of conventional video camera, um, they will be better, um, DSLs will be better at handling ISO noise than um, a video camera. I regularly shoot at 6400 when it's really, really dark. Um, and it looks, it looks good, period. And then there are different software packages to reduce that noise afterwards in the editing stage. And so um, as much as I never tell people to do this, which is the phrase you will hear is, we'll fix it in post. Um, oh, we just got it. We'll, there, we, can, we can correct that later. We can take that out later. Um, there are some things that I will shoot at knowing that I can fix it later. But that comes from a lot of experience and knowing and thinking I could do that and then finding out I couldn't. And so really knowing where those lines are. Um, so, but the things with, and I think this is, again, this is where the advantages come to a DSLR, um, unless you're going for a camera that's ten, twelve thousand um, dollars 
you have a lot more flexibility with lower light. I started out shooting at a lot of shows, a lot of music shows in poorly lit clubs and that showed that they were poorly lit um, until I got working with a camera that could handle those, those, lower light, those uh, environments of lower light better. Um, let's see, we've talked a little bit about these different concepts. Um, Did you talk about gain? Oh, ga yeah, yeah, gain is a low, medium, and high right. on the video camera. And, and it's sort of like the, the digital zoom kind of thing. Yeah. You're, you don't want, you pretty much don't want to use it. Yeah, unless you are running in the streets and, you know. And there's no other option. There's no other option. Um, you know, I've had to use it sometime. Um, there are, people are more forgiving with image quality than with sound, and we will turn to sound. Uh, next, um, one of the things, and one, one final piece on the, um, on the cameras is that there's a big price difference between a lot of these cameras. I mean, how much is the JVC, even those things The JVC is a little less than 3000 Yeah. So that's, th the JVC camera is 3000 My whole setup was about $1,000 for that, um, for a DSLR, a Canon 60D and a lens. Um, so... It's a lot more, um, it's, it can be user friendly if you have never used a DSLR before, but that was the only, but that was the only camera I could afford when I was going around the world and shooting. Um, and just for the sake of media, you can use the DSLR for nice still photos. Oh yeah. And you're not gonna do that with the with yeah. with the JVC. Yep. Justin, you wanna repeat that? And then I have a question. Okay, so that, um, Price points are very different between these different cameras. Um, you have a lot more flexibility, a lot more control with a DSLR. Um, you have a lot more flexibility with lenses and ISO, things like that. Um, it's a it can be a third of the price of you know, even a, a, a lower end, you know, uh, conventional chip video camera. What's happening now is Canon and Sony and Panasonic and these camera manufacturers are realize that all these people have been sometimes literally hacking these ca these cameras to do uh, more video work and so they have incorporated a lot of this technology and these uses into their conventional video cameras but they've also those are also more than ten thousand dollars usually sometimes seven thousand um, but you don't have to worry about the clip times and things overheating because they're built for that you have to worry about that a little bit with overheating in Canons. I've never had to worry about it ex except when I was in Ghana and I was not in a, you know, a temperate climate and there wasn't air conditioning. Um, that I needed to stop and let it cool down a little bit. Um, but I've never had any problems with it overheating. So, Justin, yeah. do you have a charter website you would recommend for a quick guide? We, I will send that around. I'm gonna post a resources doc. I'm gonna post a resources doc afterwards um, and I'll include something like that that lists out the differences between these cameras. Any other questions? Anything else anybody want to add before we go on to sound? Yeah, well, we can segue into sound yeah. by saying that the DSLRs... Yeah, DSLRs <laughs> um, have a lot of limitations on sound. You remember I pointed out the, the XLR inputs on these. So this is a type of mic known as a shotgun that um, is a very directional microphone. Whereas here, it's there, that's the microphone, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So you see it, it's these little, these four little holes, that's the microphone. Um, and you are getting just a, a broad swath of sound. Um, and it doesn't have professional microphone preamps and things like that. Um, and remember the clip time, if you, know, you don't have a secondary sound source running with a DSLR and your camera cuts out for whatever reason, you don't have that audio as well. And so um, you'll have a few different options for, aha, for microphones. And one thing to keep in mind for any microphone is what's called the polarity pattern. So this is, this is the way sound travels to a microphone, how the microphone receives the sound. 
So if we have a shotgun, which Laura is holding, this is the boom mic. You've seen everybody in the on TV and the in films holding above their people's heads. Sometimes you see it drop down and hit people if it's a slapstick comedy. If this is the front of the microphone, sound is going to be captured right in the front. It's not going to get anything over here or on the or behind it. It's very directional. You can if and if we'll 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 show you this. Actually, I'm going to correct you. I'm going that way. <laughs> well, no. So if this is the front of the microphone, the the pad it has a V-shaped pickup pattern. So that's that's in here is where you're picking up sound. Yeah. So sorry. I think I was, that's fine. I think I was explaining it the opposite way. Um, whereas you know, something like a condenser microphone or an omnidirectional microphone, like we'll get, like one of those, we'll get a whole lot. Um, you can't really control that. This is especially important if you're in a noisy environment. Um, you don't want to get all of this sound, you want to get just the sound of this one person. And you have different flexibilities to do that. Two, yeah, yeah go ahead. What about ambient sound? I hear a little buzz. Would the directional mic pick that up? Or actually... Depends where we put it and depends how loud the buzz is. Um, and so short answer, yes. Um, how much is it picking up on, on this microphone here, Gary? The buzz from? Yeah. From the projector? None of it. Yeah, no. I'm not hearing any. So, so, so these are omnidirectional mics. They are picking up all around, but they have a pretty small range. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be really close. Yeah. Um, the shotgun, again, it has that V pattern pickup. So if I'm if I'm as close as possible, it's only picking you know it's only picking up the sound within mm -hmm. that shape. But if I back off, yeah, it's going to pick pick up wider and wider. Yep. So if I'm back here behind the projector, then it's going to start picking up that projector yeah. buzz. This is something that you might be able to take out later with some specialized audio software, um, where you can pull up a spectral diagram of your sound and say, oh, that thing is, is you know, at 10,000 hertz or whatever, and you can pull out that line. It's like Photoshop for sound, Adobe Audition. It's magic. Um, it's not magic, but it's what it feels like sometimes. But keep in mind that you're pulling out that entire frequency. Yep. So you're pulling it out of people's voices. You're pulling exactly. that out of anything else that you want to yeah. keep. So. Um, so some general rules to follow with sound. The first one is get the microphone as close as possible to the person. Um, hide it. I've, I just had a shoot a couple weekends ago where um, they, I, was start, I started with three, it was three people, which is always more difficult when you have microphone, uh, micing multiple people around a table. Um, started with three labs and it just, they moved a lot and they kept hitting it and it was, okay, we're just gonna get rid of that. And so they had a bunch of art on the table because that's they're promoting an art website. And so I hid a microphone behind one of the pieces of art that couldn't be seen from the image. And so I got the microphone really close to them and got halfway decent sound. Um, not as good as I would have liked, but it was easier um, and allowed them to be more expressive, I think, because we weren't using you know, one of these microphones. So that's, that's a, a general rule of thumb. Um, that includes sneakiness of getting. The truism of that people will put up with bad um, video. I'm speaking into her the, mic. That's the next thing I'm going to say. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so getting your microphone as close to them as possible. The second, the second truism is that sound is always harder to get than video because we have been conditioned by really good fake sound in movies. 95 to 98% of what you hear in a Hollywood film has been recorded afterwards in a studio. That was the hardest thing I learned when I started doing this stuff, is that it does not sound like that just coming from the camera. Um, and so you have to think about you know, these different types of microphones, the environments, whether there's a buzz. Um, you know, One place that I usually teach this workshop, there it's on university and there's usually trucks rolling by down university, so we have to deal with that low-end noise. Sometimes um, my favorite trick is when you're shooting at someone's house, you 
you want to get rid of the ambient noise, you turn off the refrigerator, unplug the refrigerator, you put your keys in the refrigerator, the keys who, for the person who is driving, and then you can't leave until you take the keys out of the refrigerator and plug it back in so you don't need to buy them a whole new set of groceries. Um, you know, it's trying, you try to control the environment as much as possible. Um, but, you know, with some trickery and some accessories, you know, I filmed in the middle of, you know, Hmong New Year's festivals um, and got really good audio. And sometimes you want the ambient audio. Um, maybe, you, maybe you will record it afterwards and just get a really clean audio track of the interview and then put the ambient audio in underneath it. So you have more control over it and you don't necessarily have, you know, this kind of uncontrolled noise happening behind you. And the third, the third one is that um, audio paradoxically makes your video look better. Even though it's harder and it has a lot less control, um, people will forgive a whole lot more with video than they will with audio. Um, if they can't hear it, there's nothing you can do to fill in, the, fill in that missing knowledge with, with video. So that's why I have people start out, you know, like really getting their audio down first, really knowing how to do that. So a few different microphones we've already mentioned. We have, this is the lapel or the lavalier. You'll, you'll hear it referred to as, um, this is what you see on all the news broadcasts and things like that. Um, it's meant for very close up, but I've also hidden lavaliers behind mugs and pe on people's desks and things like that. Again, to, that getting those mics closer to the subject. Already saw the shotgun. Um, we can see things like the court jester is going to bring me something, I think. Well, I, where is it? It's right, it's right there on the little stand. Oh, yes. If you are just recording audio, say you are um, doing a voiceover or you're, um, you know, you're just doing an oral history, if th something like that where you don't need video, you can use one of these types of mics. Um, you'll see other ones like the Yeti. Uh, you know, mic, um, which is more of like a, you know, a radio mic or you're speaking into it. Um, these generally have to be closer to the person, so you're kind of talking directly into it. Um, Amy, can you grab that other microphone that I have there? Um, yeah, the fuzzy thing. So I've used something like this for recording voiceover on films I've made. Thank you. Thanks, Garth. Mm -hmm. um, grab the zoom. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And so then we have a few other more specialized ones. So this monstrosity is a zoom, which is an audio recorder. I'll take this off right now. So you can see the microphone on top here. And they actually have different capsules that go on top. Some of them are like XY directional mics to get a full stereo spectrum like that. Other ones will be more con condenser like that. Is there anything? There's a shotgun. There a is a shotgun. We don't have them, okay. but you can get a shotgun. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, I'll just use this to, to sit on a table in front of someone, or sometimes I'll just have them hold it if it's a really kind of run and gun kind of style. Um, otherwise, I'm taking microphones and putting them into this. We see on the left and right side, we see these XLR inputs or quarter inch, like guitar amp uh, plugs you can put a signal into there. I'll come back to that in a second of why that's important. This is another type of microphone. This is the Rode VideoMic Pro. That's meant to go on top of a camera and provide better audio than you can get, especially with a DSLR, just through the, the, um, the, micro the onboard microphone. Again, because of that directional pattern, not only is it a better microphone, in terms of its construction, but it allows for better um, sound capture because of its its polarity and its pattern. Could I use this with the computer then? Nope, you would use this for a DSLR. So it would go, it would go right in the the shoe on top. So, you see? I'm just looking at the plug. Um, it's what? Go ahead. It's fuzzy because um, that cuts down the wind noise on it. Um, in the it's referred to as a dead cat. Yep. And on that one, we call it a dead kitten. Sorry. 
Um, but you'll see it's, you know, this kind of foam windscreen, you'll see that. Um, you'll also see the Zeppelins, big on the big silver Zeppelin type things um, on microphones too. And that's all to cut out wind noise. Um, you know, again, some of it you might be able to take out later, but you know, you want to be able to control that as much as possible at the point of capture. Um, that is pretty, the, the road mic is, video mic is pretty nice, um, but you're still, I think it's on the other yeah. side. Yeah. Um, there's a f still limitations because you're still going into the camera itself. And so if your, your video cuts out, you still lose that audio as well. Um, so what I do whenever I'm shooting with this is I run what's called double system. And double system is where you have a separate audio line going separate from the camera. And so, for instance, if I'm, if I'm filming someone with this, I will have this microphone going into a zoom, and then I will have what we talk about as scratch audio or reference audio on the camera. And I can use a program um, called Pluralize or uh, actually now Premiere and Final Cut have incorporated this feature of syncing different footage with the same audio together automatically. And having, I'm sure you've had the experience of lining up footage manually and audio and video manually, it's a pain. It is not fun. And the reason it isn't, I mean, this is why they used clappers. That was a sync point for the sound and, and the, the film. What happens is that unless you get it absolutely precise, you will go out of sync down the road. And so I had to, I think I spent 14 hours one day on in one sitting just doing this two and a half hour panel discussion and keeping them synced because something happened with the audio recorder and it was just a, an, it was someone else like a, you know, presentation tech person, something failed on that person's end, and it was just a huge nightmare. And I don't have to do that anymore because we can, we can demonstrate that when we, uh, we look going to the editing section. Um, Question? Yeah. Is, is any of this specific to video, or is this the same kind of stuff you use for radio if you were doing something? You're going to, the principles of um, He asked if, if this is specific to video or if this is the same kind of stuff used in radio. The principles, I think, would be the same. Um, but if you don't have to worry about seeing the person, there's a lot more you can do. You know, I can have this mic just hanging like this, even though I'm not actually on the screen. But um, if I'm doing a voiceover, I don't care that the microphone is right in front of the person's face. So I think for this, it's here are the basic principles that help you regardless. Um, you know, why do radio stations have soundproof studios? Because they don't want to worry about all the ambient noise and things like that. So. So there are specific things you need to contend with in terms of video. Like some people don't want to see microphones. You don't want to see cords. Some people don't want to see microphones at all, which is, can be challenging, um, which is a, a good point um, to think about choosing between these in a, in, a, in a shoot. I prefer not to use these, especially folks who have never had them on before. Um, they often have felt confined or they're like moving around or they don't feel like they can move around. Um, and so I often will use a shotgun instead and we'll have it above or in a pinch we'll have it below, but you can sometimes get feet noise on there. Where's my... And also if you have it below, keeping in mind that V pickup that. pattern that it's picking up everything above it. So if planes fly overhead or birds fly overhead or the leaves rustle, you're going to yeah. hear all of that too. So the, the reason they'd have to re-record in, in film is because they can't put the microphones where it would be optimal for recording the sound. The reason why radio sound is pretty good is because they can put the microphone right there because you're not looking at it. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's funny, after you start doing this and you start learning about it, you start to see just how fake all of the sound is. Um, it's like, that, that, that doesn't sound like that. They, you know, there's a, a really distant shot my favorite of the opening of the of the conversation, which is my favorite film, um, and uh, Jen knows what's up. Um, and it starts with this really long shot, 
this long zoom into this crowded space and you can hear the characters talking like they would they're right next to you you're right next to them it's like that's impossible that that camera cannot pick up those sounds in that way um, a really excellent documentary audio documentary to think about this is the sound of sport it's um, the BBC documentary I highly recommend it it talks about the different ways that sports has been has been microphoned over or mic'd over the past century, and how <laughs> how fake it is. Um, the There's actually a really good uh, uh, program on NPR recently about I don't remember what stadium, but they actually have mics all throughout the stadium, and their sound is not fake. They're using yeah. all the real sounds from the game. Yeah. So there are some that are like that. Others, um, horse racing has. The, the soundtrack you hear for horses has been the same slowed down buffalo stampede for about 30 <laughs> years. Because you can't get, you know, you can't get a microphone right up to the horses and, you know. Um, rowing, there'll be, you know, you can't, you know, you, they want to, he goes through this, the, this engineer goes through the entire Oxford Cambridge uh, crew race. Um, from beginning to end and how he has this whole board in front of him and these microphones and they have, you know, they have mics on the coxswains but they're kind of vulgar so they have to be really careful with that. <laughs> but they can't get the sounds of the, the strokes but they know they're really even. And so they can uh, put those in, they've recorded them earlier like on, you know, on a boat and then lay them in other, uh, afterwards. So sound opens up this whole new, new world for people, both in terms of what they have to contend with, but also the possibilities. And that's, this is my favorite part of stuff to work with, which is probably uh, evident. Um, how you can, you know, my favorite editor is Walter Murch, and he has done some really incredible things with sound where he will kind of foreshadow things with sound that are gonna happen later, but you don't really notice it because it's so subtle. It's kind of like the frame rate shutter kind of thing. So um, I, you said there was a question online. Mm -hmm. Andrew is wondering if you could talk a bit about the phantom power mic, sure. especially with the lavalier mic. Sure. Does that make sense yep. to you? Okay. So phantom power is something where something like an audio recorder or some other device will be providing power to your microphone. Generally, they're at 48 volts. Um, I've seen some that need to be at 24. Um, they might need to change for different European things like that. Um, but there's something else is powering your microphone. Um, because these mics, unless they have a battery in them, they won't work on their own. Um, and usually it's just a setting um, on the, the audio recorder to turn it on. Right, so phantom power, um, the, the XLR cable um, carries the, the audio signal and then it also carries the phantom power uh, uh, of 48 volts of power mm -hmm. to power your condenser microphone. Um, and that, the power will be supplied by either the recorder or the camera if you're plugging into the camera. And mm -hmm. obviously the, the DSLRs will not supply phantom power, it just has that little plug to plug a powered mm -hmm. microphone in. Uh, but the JVCs do supply phantom power, so you can power yep. your microphones. Um, and if you if you are what? The lavalier. The lavalier. Um, it's the same. It's the same principle. The lavalier that it's going to be powered by something else, whatever it is. If it's now something to keep in mind with that is if you are running this into a camera or you're running this into an audio recorder, your battery is going to go down further because it's powering something else besides just the camera. So always keep that in mind. Um, and uh, So we actually have a lavalier mic here that will run on either phantom power or battery power, mm -hmm. which is kind of handy. Yeah. Um, and then so we also sure. have some wireless lavaliers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to go into that. Um, yeah. If you're using batteries for these things, you gotta make sure you have lots of batteries. I usually have about 20 on me at a shoot, just in case, because I, I use rechargeables because I try to be conscious, um, and they are not as reliable in these recorders. Um, they tend to save their, 
I, they either are a lot closer to being dead than they actually are, or a lot further from being dead than they actually are. And so I will just keep swapping out batteries as need be. Um, wireless versus wired labs. So generally, since I don't, a couple of reasons I don't, I don't use them because wireless labs are taking some some uh, frequency, you know, signal, um, and when you do that, it can create interference. You can get interference, and I've I've used them a couple times and have gotten interference and noise both times, and so I just I just don't use them. Um, they're really good if you're walking around somewhere, um, or you know you have you're in a very contained space where you don't have to worry about that, but Generally, if I am walking around with someone or they can't be attached, I will give them the Zoom, plug it in, and just have them put that in their pocket. And just feed, feed the cord through there and put it in their back pocket. Do it that way. And then lock it so the record button can't get hit accidentally. Otherwise, you know, we can, we're running a wireless here, but we can, you know, you'll see an XLR connection on a, um, on a lab, and then you just string that all the way back to your audio recorder uh, by your um, by your camera. So, and the thing that I always forget, but is one of the most important things, it's true. I always forget headphones. Um, headphones, and not just earbuds, even though that's what a lot of people have. Um, but you need something that covers your ears because you want to be able to hear the entire spectrum of it. So if you're, if you're, you know, unless you have some like nice Bose head, Bose earbuds, but even then I wouldn't trust them. You're missing part of the spectrum. So if you're, you know, you're missing that there is some low rumble coming from somewhere or you're getting some, you know, 50 hertz or 60 hertz hum from an audio cable crossing an electrical cable, you might not hear it if you have cheap headphones. So. It's really important to have these to be able to hear everything. Um, there's a standard uh, MDR7506, I think is the, the one of the standards, that Sony, Sony 7506. Um, that is what I've seen most people using. Um, that's what I own. I've owned two pairs, and I love them. They're great, 100 bucks, totally worth every penny. Um, but just being able to, to hear everything really well. Um, so let's see. Anything else you want to add about sound? I think we covered all the different microphones, audio recorder. Um, yeah, so double system if you're going to use a DSLR in some way, or being, being really, really careful and knowing that you are going to stop and, you know, and cut after each question, or at a certain point, you, know, you just know that, okay, stop for a second, let me stop and start, so, so you're not losing that. Any any questions? Any questions online? Okay. Um, finally, lighting. Oh, with the iPad. Sorry, mm -hmm. iPad sound. Mm -hmm. So there is there is a microphone, but we use that microphone. But I think we can use. I think you probably use the Rode as well in here. Mm -hmm. I think this is a TR. Yeah. Oh, it's just TRS. No, it's just TRS. Never mind. Well, we have to get an adapter. Um, but we have microphones that can plug in to the iPad and can be either, you know, a lav into here or um, something like the like the the Rode video mic with a certain adapter into there. And so it'll be getting better sound than it would just with the regular microphone. Um, generally, you will not get as good of sound with just your standard microphone that comes with a piece of equipment than you will with a specialty microphone and putting it in later. But that also adds another level of complexity to your shoot. We have an XLR adapter, so you okay. could pretty much plug any microphone into that XLR and nice. then plug it into the iPad. So, cool. Um, lighting. So we, there are, we'll talk about two things with lighting. Where'd my pen go? Where'd my, where'd my marker go? It's over there. We talked about white balance and color mm -hmm. temperature, so that's very important in lighting. And so the term, thank you. The term you often hear is three-point lighting. And this is for lighting a subject of some kind, for like an interview subject. So person is, I can't, I can't draw. 
Um, so the person is kind of sitting here. Um, that's a chair. <coughs> Whatever. Um, and so you will have three, it's called three points because you have three lights in this triangle shape. You have one light on the side and this is the key light. This is providing the main source of light for you and for your subject. And then on this side, we have what's called the fill light. When we can demonstrate this when we get things set up, um, you'll see that if you have it just from one side, you're going to have shadows on the other side of it. And so you want to fill those shadows in with this other light. But generally, you want to have some definition. Uh, the, I think the Laura always talks about there is the triangle, the Renaissance master triangle that you want to get. Well, you know? oh, uh, the important thing to keep in mind is that depending on the angle, it's, it's going to sculpt the person's face and make them look, a, it will change how they look and how you feel about how they look. So mm -hmm. the, the Renaissance angle, is, it's based on Rembrandt's lighting and how he painted light falling on a face and it's just kind of a nice flattering look. If the angle comes around to the side a little bit more, you get more of a side light. People look a little more mysterious or mm -hmm. angry or, you know, it's, we're, we're very affected by, by the angle of light. And it's actually a matter of inches. You move your light just yeah. a few, you know, inches and it can, it can really change the whole look. Yeah. Yeah. I also yeah. What the the way I like to describe it is that um, we're we're taking a three dimensional world, a three dimensional person, and we're representing it on a two dimensional plane, which is the TV screen. And so we want to be able to emphasize that sense of three dimensions. Um, and so I don't know if you've ever taken a drawing class and you've had to draw a sphere. And you can't just draw a circle, you have to add shading on one side and you have to add highlights on another side to make it look like three dimensions. So three-point lighting, or really any, any lighting, but three-point lighting really helps you understand the concept, helps you, um, helps you accomplish that. So the key light comes at an angle and it creates shadow on the other side. The fill light will come in and fill in some of those shadows so it's not so dark, it's not so mysterious. Um, but you still have those shadows present to, to make the nose look like it's coming off the face. Um, and then... The backlight is exactly what it sounds like. It's behind the person. And this helps to separate them from whatever background they're on. It gives them some, def some definition. It gives them a little bit of halo behind them. You get a little them. bit of light on the shadow or uh, shoulders. Yeah. And then it, that gives you further sculpting, further depth. All of this is so subtle. Um, and generally my advice to people just starting out with it is don't try to use it because if you, if, it, if you don't know what you're doing and it looks like it, it really looks like you don't know what you're doing. Um, <coughs> and it's, you know, there's ways to think about these principles um, in a ways, but that to really, to really, um, you know, have an expert like Laura um, who is, can help you, you know, craft the lights for these. Um, again, you know, I tend to go more, I'm like, sound is more important. You need to focus on your sound. Don't worry about lighting. Make sure they can see the face. It's fine. Right. Just pay attention to the, the obvious things, yeah. like <coughs> if their eyes are too dark yeah. or if they're, you yeah. know. Can't so, see. so. What I also will, what I often will use, is because I don't have, I don't have a lot of, often don't have a lot of you know, controlled environments to shoot in. When we shot a lot of videos with, with uh, the first year experience project, we had the wonders of Rarick Studio and Laura's, Laura's expertise and David expertise and folks like that. And so we had a lot of control. We had a whole light rig kit, you know, above, not even a kit, a whole rigging a light system above on the ceiling of the studios. And so we had a lot more flexibility to do that. I've never had that. I'm usually um, using some form of natural light or just whatever light is in the room and banking on my sound and my story <laughs> to make up for the lack of lighting. Um, but just some simple things to follow. You never want to put a person in front of a window. Never, ever, ever. 
um, because the light, paradoxically, the light, the light, well, not paradoxically, the light is brighter coming outside than inside, and so your figure will be blown out. Uh, your, if you have to, um, well, the, the background will be blown out because you need to have enough light on the person. Um, and so the camera is going to try to adjust for outside light, and the person is going to be basically silhouette. That's how they make silhouettes. They shoot, they have all this light coming in from the back of them, and they turn down the, the aperture so that just the person is just in silhouette. Um, you know, you can use these principles, um, you know, for instance, yeah, the bounce card, uh, the reflector. So, for instance, say we want to actually are going to use natural light. We're actually going to use a window. They're going to be on the side like they should be. And, yeah. you know, someone is sitting here getting the natural light from outside. That's going to be the key. And then we want to have a fill, and we will use this reflector as a fill. See, and... In well, yeah, face, I should, I should stand. I in. should stand still. So, um, you know, I've I've often used the reflector as my uh, main light source coming from. If, you know, if I don't have the direct. In that case, we probably want it up a little higher. We yeah. don't necessarily want the the spooky Halloween light yeah, coming yeah. from below. Well, maybe on a day like this. All right. Um, Which it's going to be hard to get. Yeah. Right now, but. But I would say you know where I'm. I usually would use that with outside light, where there's a lot more coming in and then bounce that off and have a little more control over it. The thing you need to remember about natural light is that it changes, especially during the time of year. Um, the best natural light to work with is cloudy overcast light um, because it doesn't really change that much unless you're shooting over four or five hours. The worst time to shoot would be um, late afternoon during the winter because the light changes quickly as the sun goes down. We ran into that problem with a shoot that took a couple hours, and and it just the the light kept changing over the course of it, and then we we just basically abandoned the editing of that video because it would have been too much to try and correct it afterwards. Um, the and one more thing with that, I I have you know I had the pleasure of working with a professional shooter out in New York. And he was masterful. He was balancing three different lights with exterior light and modulating them on the fly um, to match the exterior light. It was, it was incredible to watch. And I just had to sit there and ask the guy questions. It was fantastic. Um, so you just have to be aware of those kinds of conditions when you're using natural light. Um, because some things will, will change. That was the first video I made. I got caught by that too. You know, that things will change over time. And then when you try and go back and edit these together, you realize these look really different. And so just to be careful with that, which is why, again, we go to the studios to do a lot of this, because we know the light will be absolutely consistent over five or six hours. Or go shoot in a mall, because they don't want you to think that time is passing in the mall. So they keep the light really consistent. Mm -hmm. So look at that, those kinds of locations. Um, let's see. Uh, go ahead. You want to go with mall lighting, okay. Yeah, I it's not going to be great. I wouldn't go there. But. Yeah, <clears throat> you don't want to do that. Um, there's also small lights you can get to go on top of a camera just to give a little bit more illumination on the face. Um, then you'll see the, the light moving with the camera. So sometimes you will like, hold the light, have someone hold the light on top. Um, I don't think I brought that with me today. I just have a little LED panel that's about maybe a quarter of the size of that of that panel there. Um, anything else you want to add on, on lighting? Well, just uh, emphasize again the color temperature yeah. in that outside light is daylight. It's going to be anywhere between... Five and eight? Yeah. Five or lower, or dep lower. depending on the time of day. Yeah. Um, but um, And so this LED light here is actually, you'll see on the back it says 5600 K, 5600 Kelvin. So this is balanced to be used with daylight. So you can set it outside or you can use your light coming from the window as your key light and then use this as your fill light and it's going to match. Um, then the tungsten light is going to be bal better balanced with indoor lights. You also again need to watch out for fluorescent lights which can have a whole range of color balances because they add coloring to them and sometimes they're you can even see the differences of the lights in mm -hmm. here. Um, and 
facilities management doesn't really seem to keep things consistent around the university. So, yeah. um, uh, however, so if you have, let's say you have a tungsten light and you only have one light and you want to use the light from the window at the same time, and we talked about how it's really not a good idea to mix your lighting and then do a white balance because you can skew all the other colors. What we can do is take the tungsten light and where's that piece of blue you found? In the, oh, in here. <laughs> here it is. Okay. We've got colored gels. So we can take this. This is actually called CTB color temperature blue and it's a special color that can <coughs> change the, the color of the light to match. So you'll see if you see the blue from the LED. Yeah. That's, that's getting pretty close. And they come in different densities, so you can have quarter CTB, half CTB, full CTB. This looks to me like a, like a full. Um, and so you can adjust that until, until you get it right. And conversely, if you have the, the LED light and you need to mix it with, with um, tungsten light, you can add CTB, which this is actually not, or I'm sorry, CTO, and then you can change the color temperature of that light to match the tungsten. This happens to not be, this is actually an orange and not a CTO, but we do have lots of CTO gel. So. So and you can also the temperature, the actual temperature. That's one of the nice things with LEDs that it, it doesn't get hot. Oh sure, yes. So this light, I can I can touch the panel, and the, it's not hot. This one, I would want to put gloves on before I mm -hmm. okay. touch any of the metal parts. So um, long with the LED last. Yeah. The, well, it depends. Right now we have a battery on it, so however long that battery charge lasts, I. I'm not certain how long it lasts with the, with the light. They would generally last five hours on the camera, but I think the camera is going to be drawing a lot less power than this light is. Um, this one also has a dimmer, so you can dim it. Um, when you take tungsten light and you dim it, it becomes more and more orange. So you usually don't want to dim tungsten lights. What we do is we have other materials that we put in front of the light to cut down the intensity, or you can just if you have the option, you can back the light away from the subject to just have less light fall on the subject. Um, this light will also does also have a cord, so it can be powered with the with the um, in in the wall. Um, but it's nice that it has the option of a battery too, so that you can uh, take it outside. Um, this draws far less power than tungsten lights do, and that's why it can operate on a battery. These are just pull too much power to operate on a battery. Um, any other questions about that? Um, one thing we didn't talk about too is the quality of light. So you'll see that, um, if, if, can I get a volunteer for a subject? Yeah, yeah Jen, you want to just stand in right there? Um, just right about there, perfect. So and then if you face the, our, our fine audience. Um, so the, first of all, it's very hot, it's very intense, and then you'll see that it's also very harsh light. The shadows are really sharp. So that's a hard light. So we can adjust the quality of the light, too, in a number of ways. One way we could do that is take a piece of diffusion and put that in front of the light, and that will soften the light out slightly. It also takes down the intensity. Um, but so the shadows are a little bit softer. The edges are not as sharp. Uh, we can also take um, and bounce light. So we can put this umbrella in here. And then in this case, we're using the, the bounced light, so we would spin the light around and use the light that's bouncing off the umbrella. So a lot, 
less intensity. Why don't you s just step a little closer to the light? Yeah, do but you want me to take my glasses off, though? Is that going to change? I, I think you're okay. <laughs> glasses are a particularly fun challenge when lighting because you get a lot of reflection in the light. Um, tips to deal with glasses are remember that lighting is really affected by just tiny, tiny movements. So um, if you're getting a reflection in, in the light, in, in the glasses, you can raise the light. Um, sometimes if it's a little bit higher and coming down rather than shining right into the glasses, you can just move it slightly, um, you know, one, one direction or the other to try to get rid of that re reflection. Another trick sometimes is to, if it doesn't look too goofy on camera, you can take the glasses and just tip them down slightly, and that way the reflective surface is not directly across from the camera lens, so it's reflecting down instead of right into the, right into the camera. Right. But sometimes it, that just looks too weird. Or you can just have them do remove, <laughs> remove their glasses. Are, are there other pieces of advice about clothing and accessories that... Absolutely. Um, what I'm wearing is terrible. Stripes. Stripes, yes, yeah, stripes, stripes are bad. Um, possibly a moray happening with her. Oh, yeah. Yep, her stripes sweater. or small patterns can cause what's called moiré. So, jeans. And it, it, it makes this... Um, kind of dancing pattern happen on the screen. You, w you would know it when you see it. Yeah. Um, things just kind of wiggle and move. Um, Men's ties are particularly mm -hmm, bad. Mm -hmm. And then you also want to avoid, as much as possible, while wearing white because that will overexpose and then you have a hard time exposing for the face. Mm -hmm. um, and then wearing pure black, too, is sometimes something you want to avoid just for um, exposure issues and yeah. Interest in the frame, too, really. Yeah. There's um, also considerations for wardrobe with your sound. If you're wearing a um, lapel mic, you might have problems with um, silk or wool in the winter. Uh, they'll get static, and you'll get static electricity, um, and you'll hear it buzz and snap in the microphone. Reflective clothing like satins. Yep, s yep. Anything shiny can be difficult to deal with. Jewelry is hard because it will reflect the light and flare and also may hit microphones. On the other hand, jewelry sometimes is a place to place a microphone. So uh, it's kind of a give and take. T if, you're, if you're using a lapel mic, you may not want to wear a t-shirt. No. <laughs> nope. I've tell, I tell people generally to not wear red because mm -hmm. that can can also overpower um, cameras, especially um, if you're getting into the higher end of cameras that will be able, be able to handle it better, but especially on maybe the JVCs or, and I think also with some of these, they don't handle red very well. Um, I don't think there's any other color, you know, maybe like pinks and things like that, but um, just don't like red. Mostly red, yeah. yeah. Red tem tends to bloom yeah. and bleed. Yeah, so that's the only, those are the, the guidelines I, and if you're doing a green screen shoot, then don't wear green. Yeah, because <laughs> then you're just a disembodied head and hands. Unless that's what you're going unless for. That's what you, unless you're doing a spooky Halloween shoot. Mm -hmm. Also, cover images on stuff, or is that uh, sure. Well, it depends on how, how scared you are of being sued. Right. Um, right. Uh, so Alice asked about uh, copyrighted images on, on things. On T-shirts. Um, T-shirts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times you'll see somebody has a piece of tape over, you yep. know, Nike or whatever. Yep. Or if there's products in the shot, sometimes they'll turn them just enough that you can't see the brand mm -hmm. name. Or they'll just um, blur it out. Yeah. You'll see that also. Just don't get blurred out. So Rebecca's the copyright expert. You know, right? <laughs> um, uh, you know try to avoid problems as much as possible. Right, yeah. up front. Um, you know, and uh, you can uh, take some risks. You know, it's not like they're going to, uh, you know, come into the, your classroom and say that, you know, your, your particular use of uh, their trademark in that video accidentally is causing them harm. Yeah. They would have to have a much bigger case for that. But if you're going to be distributing something uh, widely and if you're going to try to make money from it, your uh, risks get higher. Sorry, I should have been standing by. Do, do we want to, should we repeat that? So, um, it you know, it depends on your uses and, you know, 
someone who wants to sue you for infringing upon their trademark needs to make a good case that you are doing harm to their trademark through your educational use or the, uh, the use of it in, uh, in an educational setting that is not about that sort of product, you know. I, you know, I mean, so anybody can sue you for anything. And I tend to not be too worried about, about it. But I also will agree with Rebecca that, you know, make sure, and it's also from an aesthetic perspective. Like, do you want someone to be looking at and focusing on what someone is on someone's shirt? Or what do you want them to be focused on what uh, someone is saying? Um, you know, I've, I did a whole paper about, a whole article about, uh, you know, this Hmong hip hop artist t-shirt and how that was a signal when I put the video on YouTube, there was a lot of comments on that shirt. And so, you know, you, and maybe this is a general kind of thing to think about when you're, when you're working with this, especially in, in you know, documentary land, is that you don't want anything to take someone out of the viewing experience of that story or what this person is saying. And so you don't want there to be, you know, bad audio or microphone hits or things like that. Um, you don't want there to be weird lighting that's going to uh, change how you, how this person is viewed or how your story is viewed. Um, so you want to, this goes back to that intentionality, like thinking through these different factors um, and these different facets of, of, your, of your production um, and what that end point is going to be. Um, the thing, the thing that I learned, and I'm still learning, and I'm still practicing, um, is that you actually shoot from the edit suite. You, you know, a lot of people when they're starting out, including myself, said, "Oh, I just need to get a bunch of footage, and then I'll just edit it later." Um, and that doesn't. It works in some cases, but it's a lot of work. Um, Frederick Wiseman is an example of a filmmaker who just goes and shoots a ton of footage and then makes the story later, and they're fantastic. But there's a ton of work and a ton. 800 hours of footage, you know, he shoots for one of his films. Um, they're all in institutions. So he spends a number of months at a specific institution, whether it's the University of California, Berkeley, or um, the uh, Royal Ballet of France, or the National Gallery of Art, which is his, his latest film, um, which is coming to the Walker next month. I'm really excited to see it. Um, you know, but you are more likely are going to be thinking ahead and say, okay, I need this. I need you to say this because I, I need it in this angle because I'm going to cut to it from this, and things like that. So there's again that more intentional way of thinking about this. Is that yes. a good segue into editing? Or yeah. I just I, I want to say, <laughs> um, we are all much more educated about using video for communication than we used to be because of YouTube and all those other things. So certain conventions have come about. So be just intentionally aware of what it is you like about a certain video and try to copy it. There's no, you know, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Use um, a light background if you like how Apple does its uh, commercials. Use a dark background if you like the other, you know, get, uh, be aware of what your preferences are and what for you gets across the message that you're trying to get with your, whatever it is you're trying to shoot. So uh, uh, educate yourself, you know, become literate, and then uh, try to mimic it. And then you'll learn from that uh, what your choices are. You have unlimited choices, so don't try to learn everything first. Go after what you think works best and, and uh, duplicate that. And ask for help. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have lots of people, including, you know, five people in this room, um, who are willing to help with these things. Um, David, Jen, Laura, Rebecca, and myself. Um, and Scott Spicer, who's the media librarian. Jenny Viley, who's the uh, media specialist for the libraries as well. Um, people in Smart Learning Commons. Um, a number of folks around here. There are you know, people to help you with this stuff. They won't necessarily shoot it for you, because that's another thing. That's, that's Gary's job. <laughs> um, and that the UM Connects job. But if you want to experiment with, you know, not just documentation, but shooting these things yourself, there are ways to, and there are people in here who can help you do that, both with equipment and running that equipment. Um, we are running close. 
We're running close to time, but I wanted to show a few things with editing. But we're having some um, technical things. You can just show it, and I'll, I'll zoom the camera. OK, out. perfect. Um, so when we when we're talking about editing, we've you know so we've got all this footage, and you know we've got some audio and we've got some video. Maybe we've got two cameras worth of audio, um, and we can look at a few different programs how we like to do it. Generally, um, there will be. Usually you're using, unless you're talking about um, a higher end platform like Avid, uh, which is a lot of uh, main, you know, kind of mainstream productions that are filmed on, you're going to be doing either an Apple product or Adobe Premiere. And those, you know, whether it's iMovie for the iPad or for a Mac or Adobe Premiere. Um, I grew up. I grew up. I learned on Final Cut 7, which is the previous version. Um, and Apple radically changed how Final Cut works when they made Final Cut X. They just skipped everything and made it, made it X. Um, and I couldn't handle that. Because you, when you're editing, for me, editing is in some ways all about control. You want to know where your stuff is, where it lives, where, you know, what you can do with it. And Apple kind of took that power away. And they wanted to tell you where stuff was saved. And it just, it just created a lot of problems in my workflow. So I, I learned Adobe Premiere, which I'll be demonstrating today quickly. Um, also show a little bit of iMovie on the, on the iPad. So I'll load up Premiere quickly and show and just kind of give an overview of it working. So we can start a new project. New project. We'll just skip over this quick. Um, let's see if we can. Amy, can you grab the lights on this side just to get the, the front? Are they out? Or are they up here? No, they're over there. So remember when I was talking about those, um, there you go, those sync issues? And those kind of automatic, automatic slash auto magically syncing, um, that program will spit out what's called an XML file. And if you're a librarian, you know what XML is. Um, this is a document that tells the computer where these uh, files are, um, how long they are, and things like that. And so I will drag this in to Premiere, and don't worry about that. And now we have. A sequence that doesn't work. This is a good example. So I imported this footage. Why doesn't it work? Because platforms like this and are called nonlinear editing platforms, which means on one hand, or there's, they're nonlinear and they're non-destructive. Nonlinear means that you don't have to edit on an old Moviola film line at a time, you know, one film strip at a time. You can move all the stuff around any place you'd like um, in any order, just jump things around, things like you don't have to do it all in one, one line. The non-destructive part is that you aren't actually editing the video in this. You are editing these placeholders of the video. The problem with that, and then so then when you when you go to go to render the video and export the video, it renders it together as the video that you will see on YouTube or on DVD or things like that. It's really nice that you don't have to edit the video itself because you're not. It's not like you're cutting film and you can't go back to it. You can I can undo anything I, I need to in this. But the problem is, this video has to live in a in a, a same place over the course of a project. Otherwise, you get these ugly screens and say, oh, we've lost the connection. We don't know where this thing is. It's not where you said it is. I don't know what to do. So we have to go and link the media. This has gotten a lot easier, too. Um, and find where that, that media is. So we're looking for 51, 57. 
And it's going to locate all those. And so now we have, there's Sarah, and I have to get the other one. Now we have that. Now we just need to get the audio. And so this is why, I mean, this is part of the reason that Apple went the way it did, is because then it's going to save all the stuff in one place for you. And so you don't have to worry about this. So in some ways, it's a nice feature. But if you're working collaboratively and you try to send, a, send some things to someone else, it's really hard to do, and I've lost footage that way. That's when I stopped using it. I'm like, okay, this isn't worth my time to learn because um, we can't. We just don't have that that capability, um, and I don't have the time to reshoot footage that I lost because it wasn't on anything super important, thankfully. Um, so we have four main windows here. You have the project window, which is where all of your source files live. You have your uh, timeline here, which is where you're editing. You have the source, which is where the source of your video will be shown. So this is anything. This is where you would put any effects, any you know, mix audio and things like that. And the program window is the final product. So if I, for instance, want to warm up Sarah a little bit. I will do a fast color corrector. And I should see, I actually don't have that in here. Yeah. So you can see it there. It's still not working. Should show up in the program monitor. So. Yeah, that's it. I just put the first one. Thanks, David. So we'll see it. On you know, see the reflected on on here as well. So. Zoom tight. Zoom tight. So. That's the basic out outline of it. And then you are you know, using the different cut commands to move things around. You know, there I want to get rid of that. I want to move that here, things like that. Um, there are ways to work with two cameras uh, where you are automatically cutting between the two of them. Um, so you don't have to go through, like, I want this section up here. You can um, set it up in a way that you're hitting like one and two when you want to cut between the two of them. Um, that's something if you know you have a long interview that you know you can just kind of do that with. Um, there's also, you can see we have our separate audio track down here. So you know we have audio on, on the video itself. Um. That's, Laura, that's Rebecca. <laughs> I just want. What is like? You talked a lot, Rebecca. I use a lot of email. Um, most of my client correspondence is done over the internet. So the majority of my clients are not in Minnesota; they're all over the country. And that's the audio from just the camera. Cool. Now let's mute all of those and turn on the good audio. Part, um, I'll have clients who are here in Minnesota, or perhaps in a neighboring state, but their fiance or their wife or their family member is in Lebanon or in India or in... There still is some noise, and this is just being played through my speakers, but there still is some noise because there's some HVAC in the studios that I had to take out a later, um, or just at least turn down. So you are, you have a lot of control. You can, you know, layer in music, and you can layer in all sorts of things with this. Um, you know, if you are, I'll just quickly turn before we, before we wrap up, 
um, turn over to the to the iPad. So also they want to make all the things for you. So like, we'll do bright. And then we can shoot. Shoot a quick amount of video. Should go up here. Okay, Amen. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, all no, right. This connection's a little wonky. Okay. So we can shoot a little video. There's Rebecca, there's my water, there's Laura, there's Garth. <laughs> you click on use video. Now we see it in the timeline here. And we can drag this through and then edit it, edit it from here. So um, we've used this as uh, for um, for different groups who are not as familiar with it and, e and editing on the iPad. Um, I teach a basic production course for the Courage Center, which is a movement rehab facility out in Golden Valley. Um, and so we, we started teaching it with um, a bunch of you know conventional cameras and we tried to edit with Final Cut and it was just a, a mess. We couldn't do it because there's such a steep learning curve with Final Cut. Um, then the director of the program there said, hey, what about the iPads? And that was the, then we started making, actually making stuff. And we did a whole film, a whole short film in two weeks with footage we shot at the zoo. And we were collaboratively, you know, editing it together, just, you know, pulling down on here and, um, you know, swiping down to do a cut here. You see this, the cut thing comes at the bottom. And just zooming in uh, and seeing this part, you know, so there's a lot of possibilities to get started with this. And I realize now we're just a little over time. So um, on the, the resources sheet that I'll put up in the Dash workshop materials folder, there's a lot of different options on campus. Lynda.com trainings for pretty much every tool you would want to use from Premiere, Avid, all the way down to iMovie uh, on the iPad to, you know, and on the, on the Mac. Um, there are, you know, there are lots of people who want to help you, um, be willing to help um, with a project and getting started. Um, and finally, one of the most important things that as a ma uh, data management person, uh, make sure all of your stuff is backed up in two places, preferably one of which is not in a place with the other one. So your house can burn down and you don't lose that footage. I've had hard drives stolen from me. It is not a fun experience. The person missed one, so I still have a project. Um, I now have five hard drives in a, in a Wells Fargo safe deposit box. So I need to update them. I keep saying that, but I'm going to update them. Yeah. Any? And Rebecca? And where are you publishing these things to, uh, like YouTube or, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So are you? Is it? Well, distribution is important. Um, know your audience. Yeah. Want to repeat yeah. that? Um, just distribution is important. Know your audience. Um, so where you're publishing them. If you're going to be publishing them as a DVD, um, that's going to going to both limit and incur and expand your audiences. Um, you know, YouTube versus Vimeo versus you know Media Mill, perhaps Elevator or the University Digital Conservancy and things like that. Um, but knowing that you know where your stuff is and is backed up and safe. So, any other questions? today? Okay. Okay, everybody. 
thanks for coming and thanks for coming, you know, for those of you who came for the all of the workshops. So thank you. Not see you next time. If you want to do hands on. Yeah, if you have time and want to stop yeah. and look at some of the equipment, we're happy to answer questions.